Section 9 of Lukundu and Other Stories by Edward Lucas White Amina Waldo, brought face to face with the actuality of the unbelievable, as he himself would have worded it, was completely dazed. In silence he suffered the consul to lead him from the tepid gloom of the interior, through the ruinous doorway, out into the hot, stunning brilliance of the desert landscape. Hassan followed, with never a look behind him. Without any word he had taken Waldo's gun from his nerveless hand and carried it, with his own and the consul's. The consul strode across the gravelly sand, some fifty paces from the southwest corner of the tomb, to a bit of not wholly ruined wall from which there was a clear view of the doorway's side of the tomb, and of the side with the larger crevice. "'Hassan,' he commanded, "'watch here,' Hassan said something in Persian. "'How many cubs were there?' the consul asked Waldo. Waldo stared mute. "'How many young ones did you see?' the consul asked again. Twenty or more?' Waldo made answer. "'That's impossible,' snapped the consul. "'There seemed to be sixteen or eighteen, Waldo asserted. Hassan smiled and grunted. The consul took from him two guns, handed Waldo his, and they walked around the tomb to a point about equally distant from the opposite corner. There was another bit of ruin, and in front of it, on the side toward the tomb, was a block of stone mostly in the shadow of the wall. "'Convenient,' said the consul. "'Sit on that stone and lean against the wall. Make yourself comfortable. You are a bit shaken, but you will be all right in a moment. You should have something to eat, but we have nothing. Anyhow, take a good swallow of this.' He stood by him as Waldo gasped over the raw brandy. "'Hassan will bring you his water-bottle before he goes.' The consul went on, "'Drink plenty, for you must stay here for some time. And now pay attention to me. We must extirpate these vermin. The male, I judge, is absent. If he had been anywhere about, you would not now be alive. The young cannot be as many as you say, but I take it we have to deal with tin, a full litter. We must smoke them out. Hassan will go back to camp after fuel, and the guard. Meanwhile you and I must see that none escape.' He took Waldo's gun, opened the breech, shut it, examined the magazine, and handed it back to him. "'Now, watch me closely,' he said. He paced off, looking to his left past the tomb. Presently he stopped and gathered several stones together. "'You see these?' he called. Waldo shouted in affirmation. The consul came back, passed on in the same line, looking to his right past the tomb, and presently, at a similar distance, put up another tiny cairn, shouted again, and was again answered. Again he returned. "'Now you are sure you cannot mistake these two marks I have made?' "'Very sure indeed,' said Waldo. "'It is important,' warned the consul. "'I am going back to where I left Hassan, to watch there while he is gone. You will watch here. You may pace as often as you like to either of those stone heaps. From either you can see me on my beat. Do not diverge from the line from one to the other.' For as soon as Hassan is out of sight, I shall shoot any moving thing I see nearer. Sit here till you see me set up similar limits for my sentry. Go on the farther side, then shoot any moving thing not on my line of patrol. Keep a lookout all around you. There is one chance in a million that the male might return in daylight. Mostly they are nocturnal, but this lair is evidently exceptional. Keep a bright lookout." And now listen to me. You must not feel any foolish sentimentalism about any fancied resemblance of these vermin to human beings. Shoot, and shoot to kill. Not only is it our duty in general to abolish them, but it will be very dangerous for us if we do not. There is little or no solidarity in Mohammedan communities, but on the comparatively few points upon which public opinion exists, it acts with amazing promptitude and vigor, one matter as to which there is no disagreement is that it is incumbent upon every man to assist in eradicating these creatures. The good old biblical custom of stoning to death is the mode of lynching indigenous hereabouts. These modern Asiatics are quite capable of applying it to anyone believed derelict against any of these inimical monsters. If we let one escape and the rumor of it gets about, we may precipitate an outburst of racial prejudice difficult to cope with. Shoot, I say, without hesitation or mercy. I understand, said Waldo. I don't care whether you understand or not, said the consul, 
I want you to act. Shoot if needful, and shoot straight. And he tramped off. Hassan presently appeared, and Waldo drank from his water bottle, as nearly all of its contents as Hassan would permit. After his departure, Waldo's first alertness soon gave place to mere endurance of the monotony of watching and the intensity of the heat. His discomfort became suffering, and what with the fury of the dry glare, the pangs of thirst, and his bewilderment of mind, Waldo was moving in a waking dream by the time Hassan returned with two donkeys and a mule laden with brushwood. Behind the beast straggled the guard. Waldo's trance became a nightmare when the smoke took effect and the battle began. He was, however, not only not required to join in the killing, but was enjoined to keep back. He did keep very much in the background, seeing only so much of the slaughter as his curiosity would not let him refrain from viewing. Yet he felt all a murderer as he gazed at the ten small carcasses laid out a row in the memory of his vigil and its end. Indeed, most of the whole day, though it was the day of his most marvelous adventure, remains to him as the broken recollections of a phantasmagoria. On the morning of his memorable peril, Waldo had waked early. The experiences of his sea voyage, the sights at Gibraltar, at Port Said, in the canal, at Suez, at Aden, at Muscat, and at Basra, had formed an altogether inadequate transition from the decorous regularity of house and school life in New England to the breathless wonder of the desert immensities. Everything seemed unreal, and yet the reality of its strangeness so besieged him that he could not feel at home in it. He could not sleep heavily in a tent. After composing himself to sleep, he lay long conscious and awakened early, as on this morning, just at the beginning of the false dawn. The consul was fast asleep, snoring loudly. Waldo dressed quietly and went out, mechanically without any purpose or forethought, taking his gun. Outside he found Hassan, seated, his gun across his knees, his head sunk forward, as fast asleep as the consul. Ali and Ibrahim had left the camp the day before, for supplies. Waldo was the only waking creature about, for the guards, camped some little distance off, were but logs about the ashes of their fire. Meaning merely to enjoy, under the white glow of the false dawn, the magical reappearance of the constellations and the short last glory of the star-laden firmament, that brief coolness which compensated a trifle for the hot morning, the fiery day and the warmish night, he seated himself on a rock some paces from the tent and twice as far from the guards. Turning his gun in his hands, he felt an irresistible temptation to wander off by himself, to stroll alone through the fascinating emptiness of the arid landscape. When he had begun camp life, he had expected to find the consul, that combination of sportsman, explorer, and archaeologist, a particularly easy-going guardian. He had looked forward to absolutely untrammeled liberty in the spacious expanse of the limitless wastes. The reality he had found exactly the reverse of his preconceptions. The consul's first injunction was, Never let yourself get out of sight of me or of Hassan unless he or I send you off with Ali or Ibrahim. Let nothing tempt you to roam about alone. Even a ramble is dangerous. You might lose sight of the camp before you knew it. At first Waldo acquiesced. Later he protested. I have a good pocket compass. I know how to use it. I never lost my way in the main woods. No cords in the main woods, said the consul. Yet before long Waldo noticed that the few cords they encountered seemed simple-hearted, peaceful folk. No semblance of danger or even of adventure had appeared. Their armed guard of a dozen greasy Tatardamalians had passed their time in uneasy loafing. Likewise, Waldo noticed that the consul seemed indifferent to the ruins they passed by or encamped among, that his feeling for sights and topography was cooler than lukewarm, that he showed no ardor in the pursuit of the scanty and uninteresting game. He had picked up enough of several dialects to hear repeated conversations about them. Have you heard of any about here? Has one been killed? Any traces of them in this district? and such queries he could make out in the various talks with the natives they met. As to what they were, he received no enlightenment. Then he had questioned Hassan as to why he was so restricted in his movements. Hassan spoke some English and regaled him with tales of Afrits, ghouls, specters, and other uncanny legendary presences, of the djinn of the waste appearing in human shape, talking all languages, ever on the alert to 
ensnare infidels, of the woman whose feet turned the wrong way at the ankles, luring the unwary to a pool and there drowning her victims, of the malignant ghosts of dead brigands, more terrible than their living fellows, of the spirit in the shape of a wild ass, or of a gazelle enticing its pursuers to the brink of a precipice, and itself seeming to run ahead upon an expanse of sand, a mere mirage, dissolving as the victim passed the brink and fell to death, of the limp sprite in the semblance of a hare feigning a limp, or of a ground bird feigning a broken wing, drawing its pursuer after it till he met death in an unseen pit or well shaft. Ali and Ibrahim spoke no English. As far as Waldo could understand their long harangues, they told similar stories or hinted at dangers equally vague and imaginary. These childish bogey tales merely whetted Waldo's craving for independence. Now as he sat on a rock, longing to enjoy the perfect sky, the clear early air, the wide lonely landscape, along with the sense of having it to himself, it seemed to him that the consul was merely innately cautious, over-cautious. There was no danger. He would have a fine leisurely stroll, kill something perhaps, and certainly be back in camp before the sun grew hot. He stood up. Some hours later he was seated on a falling coping stone in the shadow of a ruined tomb, all the country they had been traversing is full of tombs and remains of tombs, prehistoric, Bactrian, Old Persian, Parthian, Sasanian, or Mohammedan, scattered everywhere in groups or solitary. Vanished utterly are the faintest traces of the cities, towns, and villages, ephemeral houses or temporary huts, in which had lived the countless generations of mourners who had reared these tombs. The tombs built more durably than mere dwellings of the living remained. Complete or ruinous, or reduced to mere fragments, they were everywhere. In that district they were all of one type. Each was domed and below was square, its one door facing eastward and opening into a large room, behind which were the mortuary chambers. In the shadow of such a tomb Waldo sat. He had shot nothing, had lost his way, had no idea of the direction of the camp, was tired, warm, and thirsty. He had forgotten his water bottle. He swept his gaze over the vast, desolate prospect, the unburied turquoise of the sky arched above the rolling desert, far reddish hills along the skyline hooped in the less distant brown hillocks which, without diversifying it, hummocked the yellow landscape. Sand and rocks with a lean, starved bush or two made up the nearer view, broken here and there by dazzling white or streaked grayish, crumbling ruins. The sun had not been long above the horizon, yet the whole surface of the desert was quivering with heat. As Waldo sat viewing the outlook, a woman came round the corner of the tomb. All the village women Waldo had seen had worn yashmaks, or some other form of face covering or veil. This woman was bareheaded and unveiled. She wore some sort of yellowish-brown garment, which enveloped her from neck to ankles, showing no waistline. Her feet, in defiance of the blistering sands, were bare. At sight of Waldo, she stopped and stared at him, as he at her. He remarked the un-European posture of her feet, not at all turned out, but with the inner lines parallel. She wore no anklets, he observed, no bracelets, no necklace or earrings. Her bare arms, he thought, the most muscular he had ever seen on a human being. Her nails were pointed and long, both on her hands and feet. Her hair was black, short and tousled, yet she did not look wild or uncomely. Her eyes smiled, and her lips had the effect of smiling, though they did not part ever so little, not showing at all the teeth behind them. "'What a pity,' said Waldo aloud, "'that she does not speak English.' "'I do speak English,' said the woman, and Waldo noticed that as she spoke her lips did not perceptibly open. "'What does the gentleman want?' "'You speak English?' Waldo exclaimed, jumping to his feet. "'What luck! Where did you learn it?' "'At the mission school,' she replied, an amused smile playing about the corners of her rather wide, unopening mouth. "'What can be done for you?' She spoke with scarcely any foreign accent, but very slowly and with a sort of growl running along from syllable to syllable. "'I am thirsty,' said Waldo, "'and I have lost my way.' "'Is the gentleman living in a brown tent, shaped like half a melon?' she inquired the queer, rumbling note drawling from one word to the next, her lips barely separated. "'Yes, that is our camp,' said Waldo. "'I could guide the gentleman that way,' 
she droned. But it is far, and there is no water on that side. I want water first, said Waldo, or milk. If you mean cow's milk, we have none. But we have goat's milk. There is to drink where I dwell, she said, sing-songing the words. It is not far. It is the other way. Show me, said he. She began to walk, Waldo, his gun under his arm beside her. She trod noiselessly and fast. Waldo could scarcely keep up with her. As they walked, he often fell behind and noted how her swathing garments clung to a lithe, shapely back, neat waist and firm hips. Each time he hurried and caught up with her, he scanned her with intermittent glances, puzzled that her waist, so well marked at the spine, showed no particular definition in front, that the outline of her from neck to knees, perfectly shapeless under her wrappings, was without any waistline or suggestion of firmness or undulation. Likewise, he remarked the amused flicker in her eyes and the compressed line of her red, her too red, lips. "'How long were you in the mission school?' he inquired. Four years,' she replied. "'Are you a Christian?' he asked. "'The free folk do not submit to baptism,' she stated simply, but with rather more of the droning growl between her words. He felt a queer shiver as he watched the scarcely moving lips through which the syllables edged their way. "'But you are not veiled,' he could not resist saying. "'The free folk,' she rejoined, "'are never veiled.' "'Then you are not a Mohammedan,' he ventured. "'The free folk are not Muslims.' "'Who are the free folk?' he blurted out incautiously. She shot one baleful glance at him. Waldo remembered that he had to do with an Asiatic... He recalled the three permitted questions. "'What is your name?' he inquired. "'Amina,' she told him. "'That is a name from the Arabian Nights,' he hazarded. "'From the foolish tales of the believers,' she sneered. "'The free folk know nothing of such follies.' The unvarying shutness of her speaking lips, the drawly burr between the syllables, struck him all the more as her lips curled but did not open. "'You utter your words in a strange way,' he said. "'Your language is not mine,' she replied. "'How is it that you learned my language at the mission school and are not a Christian?' "'They teach all at the mission school,' she said. "'And the maidens of the free folk are like the other maidens they teach, "'though the free folk, when grown, are not as town dwellers are.' Therefore they taught me as any town-bred girl, not knowing me for what I am. They taught you well, he commented. I have the gift of tongues, she uttered enigmatically, with an odd note of triumph, burring the words through her unmoving lips. Waldo felt a horrid shudder all over him, not only at her uncanny words, but also for mere faintness. Is it far to your home? he breathed. It is there she said, pointing to the doorway of a large tomb just before them. The holy open arch admitted them into a fairly spacious interior, cool with the abiding temperature of thick masonry. There was no rubbish on the floor. Waldo, relieved to escape the blistering glare outside, seated himself on a block of stone midway between the door and the inner partition wall, resting his gun butt on the floor. For the moment he was blinded by the change from the insistent brilliance of the desert morning to the blurred gray light of the interior. When his sight cleared, he looked about and remarked, opposite the door, the ragged hole which laid open the desecrated mausoleum. As his eyes grew accustomed to the dimness, he was so startled that he stood up. It seemed to him that from its four corners the room swarmed with naked children. To his inexperienced conjecture, they seemed about two years old, but they moved with the assurance of boys of eight or ten. "'Who are these children?' he exclaimed. "'Mine,' she said. "'All yours?' he protested. "'All mine,' she replied, a curious, suppressed boisterousness in her demeanor. "'But there are twenty of them,' he cried. "'You count badly in the dark,' she told him. "'There are fewer.' "'There certainly are a dozen,' he maintained, spinning round as they danced and scampered about. The free people have large families, she said. But they are all of one age, Waldo exclaimed, his tongue dry against the roof of his mouth. She laughed, 
an unpleasant mocking laugh, clapping her hands. She was between him and the doorway, and as most of the light came from it, he could not see her lips. "'Is not that like a man? No woman would have made that mistake.' Waldo was confuted and sat down again. The children circulated around him, chattering, laughing, giggling, snickering, making noises indicative of glee. "'Please get me something cool to drink,' said Waldo, and his tongue was not only dry but big in his mouth. "'We shall have to drink shortly,' she said. "'But it will be warm.' Waldo began to feel uneasy. The children pranced around him, jabbering strange, guttural noises, licking their lips, pointing at him, their eyes fixed on him with now and then a glance at their mother. "'Where is the water?' The woman stood silent, her arms hanging at her sides, and it seemed to Waldo she was shorter than she had been. "'Where is the water?' he repeated. "'Patience, patience,' she growled and came a step nearer to him. The sunlight struck upon her back and made a sort of halo about her hips. She seemed still shorter than before. There was something furtive in her bearing, and the little ones sniggered evilly. At that instant two rifle shots rang out almost as one. The woman fell face downward on the floor. The babies shrieked in a shrill chorus. Then she leaped up from all fours with an explosive suddenness, staggered in a hurled, lurching rush toward the hole in the wall, and with a frightful yell threw up her arms and whirled backward to the ground, doubled and contorted like a dying fish, stiffened, shuddered, and was still. Waldo, his horrified eyes fixed on her face, even in his amazement, noted that her lips did not open. The children, squealing faint cries of dismay, scrambled through the hole in the inner wall, vanished into the inky void beyond. The last had hardly gone when the consul appeared in the doorway, his smoking gun in his hand. "'Not a second too soon, my boy,' he ejaculated. "'She was just going to spring.' He cocked his gun and prodded the body with the muzzle. "'Good and dead,' he commented. "'What luck! Generally it takes three or four bullets to finish one. I've known one with two bullets through her lungs to kill a man.' "'Did you murder this woman?' Waldo demanded fiercely. "'Murder?' the consul snorted. "'Murder! Look at that!' He knelt down and pulled open the full closed lips, disclosing not human teeth, but small incisors, cusped, grinders, white-spaced, and long, keen, overlapping canines, like those of a greyhound, a fierce, deadly, carnivorous dentition, menacing and combative. Waldo felt a qualm, yet the face and form still swayed his horrified sympathy for their humanness. "'Do you shoot women because they have long teeth?' Waldo insisted, revolted at the horrid death he had watched. "'You are hard to convince,' said the consul sternly. "'Do you call that a woman?' He stripped the clothing from the carcass. Waldo sickened all over. What he saw was not the front of a woman, but more like the underside of an old fox terrier with puppies, or of a white sow with her second litter from collarbone to groin ten lolloping udders, two rows, mauled, stringy, and flaccid. "'What kind of a creature is it?' he asked faintly. "'A ghoul, my boy,' the consul answered solemnly almost in a whisper. "'I thought they did not exist,' Waldo babbled. "'I thought they were mythical. I thought there were none.' "'I can very well believe that there are none in Rhode Island,' the consul said gravely. This is in Persia, and Persia is in Asia. End of section 9